but let's not take any more time and let's have uh, invite Harvey Brown to give us his talk, please. Should we start? Yes. Okay. Well, first of all, many thanks to Nick for the invitation to speak today. It's it's a privilege and really an emotional day for me because I was I had the privilege of teaching Nick when he was an, an obviously a rising star as an undergraduate in Oxford. And of course we've had many, many contacts since then. And it's my first occasion to speak at this particular at this university. So it's a great pleasure for me. Thank you very That's much. True. It's great to have you here. Thank you. And also hi to the <laughs> and Chris, very nice to see you. And thank you very much for lending us a few weeks ago. Niels, we had a wonderful meeting together in um, in Chicago. Hi, Niels. And hi to all the others. Well, <laughs> between 1905, when, of course, when Einstein developed his first special theory of relativity in 1915, Einstein was searching for a relativistic theory of gravity. It was a very rocky road, and he followed many false trails and used several fundamental conceptual principles to guide him to the promised land. And he made it, but not because of the principles per se. In virtually every case, as we'll see, the principles worked out to didn't quite um, do the job that he was expecting them to do. And we'll see how that worked in, the, in, in a few moments. But he did manage to find his way, and he smelt his way through as much as thought his way through. Uh, in stressing the role of the action-reaction principle, once he found his theory of gravity, when, in promoting his theory, this talk will be based largely on joint work with Dennis Lenko, a paper from a few years ago, and more recently, a paper with um, James Reed. There are members of the audience here who are not um, experts in, in general relativity or even in physics generally, so you'll bear in mind that in, in some years. I don't seem to endeavor to shift that. Uh, down. No thanks. This is a an excerpt from a letter that Einstein wrote in 1954, this is a year before Einstein's death, to a man called George Jaffe, who he had a, with whom he had some kind of correspondence. You consider the transition to special relativity, this is the theory he developed in 1905, as the most essential thought of relativity, not the transition to general relativity, his theory of gravity. I consider the reverse to be correct. I see the most essential thing in the overcoming of the inertial system, the inertial coordinate system, a thing which acts upon all processes but undergoes no reaction. The concept is in principle no better than that of the center of the universe in Aristotelian physics. And so here we see a clear indication that for Einstein, an extremely important aspect of his theory of general relativity was that it was a vindication of the action-reaction principle. That when a body acts on another body, that body reacts back on the first body. And that's essential to the notion of a body being a substance. And Einstein is arguing that the critical feature of his general theory of relativity, his new theory of gravity, is that it vindicated this principle. Whereas previous theories in physics, in fact, his own theory of special relativity, violated it. So we're going to look and see exactly why this came about. I am very doubtful about this argument. Not because general relativity violates the action-reaction principle, it doesn't. The question is, do the previous theories violate it? So there's a certain amount here, I think, of um, propaganda as well as, as well as clear thought. But we'll see how that, that worked out. The action-reaction principle. Well, let's go back to Newton, because this is a deep intuition about the nature of substance. In physics, we don't really ask ourselves what things are. What is an electron? We ask ourselves what does an electron do when it interacts with other things? It's what things do rather than what they are. And in a sense, this is the very nature of substance. Isaac Newton, here in a, in a um, 
manuscript that he wrote before the Principia, some years before the Principia, he was writing about the nature of substance. For although philosophers don't explicitly define substance as entity that can act on things, they all tacitly understand substance in that way. And they would hardly allow that something is substance if it couldn't move or act. For example, couldn't arouse in the mind any sensation or perception, whatever. And implicit in this is that not only do substances act, but they're acted back upon. Now, of course, his great rival, metaphysical rival, Leibniz, although they differed tremendously in their metaphysics, and, in, and indeed in their theories about space and time, Leibniz had exactly the same intuition of the nature of substance. I maintain also that substances, whether material or immaterial, cannot be conceived in their bare essence without any activity, activity being of the essence of substance in general. And the notion of extent, extension in space presupposes the substance of body, which involves the power of acting and resistance. And indeed, in, in the, in the um, De Gravitatione, in, in Newton's um, pre-Principia ma uh, manuscript, Newton says, look, imagine that you have a region of space which is impenetrable to other bodies. Is it the region of space that's impenetrable? Well, that's a substance. Because it's trying to prevent other bodies from entering it, it's acting on other bodies. That's a substance. Now, we don't, let's not ask ourselves what it is in and of itself. It just has the power of resisting other bodies to enter into it. It's a substance. Now, what about space itself? Well, of course, in the philosophy of physics, we attribute the notion of substantivalism of space um, to Newton, Newton being the great, um, as it were, paradigm case of substantivalist about space. But let's look a little bit more carefully at what Newton actually says. Again, this is in the De Gravitatione. Space itself contains no force of any kind that could in any way hinder or help change in the motion of bodies. That's why projectiles travel in straight lines at a uniform speed unless they meet with an impediment from some other source. So here, Newton is referring to the first law of motion, his first law of motion, which of course he took from Descartes, the idea that if you have a force-free body, it is going to move in a straight line at a uniform speed. That's the first law of motion. And what he's saying here is that this is not a result of the nature of space. Space itself, because it doesn't act, is not impeding the body. So the body carries out its natural motion. It's not a result of a property of space itself. Space is simply doing nothing to impede the natural motion, because space doesn't act. Extension is eternal, infinite, uncreated, uniform throughout, in no way mobile, unable to affect how bodies move, minds think, whereas body is opposite in every respect. So for, for Newton, space is not a substance despite the fact that he's often taken to be the paradigm example of a substance idealist about space. Of course, what is space for Newton? It's not a substance, but neither is it an accident, using medieval terms. It's sui generis. And Newton wasn't the only medieval, late medieval philosopher, or natural philosopher, who regarded space and time as something special. They're neither substance nor accident. But we have to be very careful in labeling Newton um, a substantive was given his, his own views about the nature of space and the nature of substance. Well, here are, this is a list of the key principles, if you like, conceptual signposts, conceptual guiding principles that, that Einstein had in developing his theory of gravity. Of course, in special relativity, it's clear that Newtonian gravity will not work. Newtonian gravity involves action at a distance between bodies, instantaneous action at a distance. And in special relativity, if you have a frame of reference, a coordinate system, relative to which the, the gravitational interaction is instantaneous, if you now to consider a moving observer establishing a new moving frame of reference with respect to the first one, 
that interaction will no longer be instantaneous because of the relativity of simultaneity. Well, that wasn't the only reason why, why Einstein understood that gravity couldn't be, Newtonian gravity couldn't be reconciled with special relativity, but that was, that's one of the key, key issues. If you don't have Newtonian gravity, which is, of course, hugely successful, what are you going to do? Special relativity is completely silent about the gravitational interaction. Special relativity is essentially a constraint on the non-gravitational interactions, namely that their equations must have a certain symmetry property called Lorentz covariance. How do we find a theory of gravity that will be consistent with the demands of special relativity? Well, of course, the most famous principle and the one that survived to the most to the greatest extent was the famous equivalence principle. I'll say more about that in a moment. It's roughly speaking the idea that a uniform gravitational field cannot be distinguished from a uniform acceleration of the body. I'll say more about that in a moment. Then there's the principle of the relativity of motion. Now, in special relativity, you think of Galileo's ship. Galileo said, if I have a ship at rest and I do experiments in the cabin of the ship, I, I close the, 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 the windows and I'm not aware of the motion of the ship with respect to the shore. If I set up the same initial conditions when the ship is at rest, and I do all my experiments using those initial conditions, and I repeat those exact experiments with the same initial conditions when the ship happens to be moving uniformly over a calm water, with respect, so it's moving with respect to the shore, you are going to see exactly the same effects. This is the relativity principle. Well, it's Galileo's version of the relativity principle, but it's essentially the same as Einstein's in 1905. All of the equations of the non-gravitational interactions, all of those fundamental equations, will take the same form in every so-called inertial reference frame. And these are frames that move at uniform speeds with respect to each other. Of course, that's not a defining property of the inertial frames, but let's leave it at that for the moment. Einstein had the intuition in the years following 1905 that there was something wrong with this principle because it was restricted to the so-called inertial frames, the frames relative to which force-free bodies moved in straight lines at uniform speeds. And Einstein's thinking was, this is too restrictive. We really want to generalize the relativity principle. We want to say that the equations, the fundamental equations of physics, should take the same form in any coordinate systems we choose. In other words, in, in, in all conceivable frames of reference. And this led him to the notion of general covariance. General covariance is precisely the claim that the fundamental equations of physics should take the same form in all conceivable coordinate systems, not just the inertial coordinate systems. This didn't work, and we'll see why in a moment. Then, importantly, there was Mach's principle, and of course, we're going to see that there's, there's eventually going to be a relationship between the relative, the general generalization of the relativity principle and Mach's principle. Now, Ernst Mach famously had a critique of Newtonian mechanics that involved the origin of inertia. So consider, for example, Newton's two globes. We have two globes that are circling each other, and there's a string between them. And we have the circular motion. And eventually, there's going to be a tension in that string. And that's because of the centrifugal effect. Or take a bucket of water in which the surface of the water is flat and start rotating the bucket. Because of the centrifugal effect, the surface of the water is going to become concave. Now, what is causing this? The old-fashioned Newtonian would say, well, it's being caused by rotation with respect to absolute space. Well, nowadays we don't talk about absolute space, we talk about inertial frames. And so we say, the reason that we get the centrifugal effect is because if the bodies were force-free, they would like to move in straight lines at uniform speeds with respect to inertial frames, but we're forcing the bodies out of their inertial motion. Okay? The water is being forced into a circular motion, but since it has a tendency to move in straight lines, there's going to be a centrifugal effect. This is just an outcome of the first law of motion. Now, Marx said, well, wait a minute, if you say the cause of this is motion with respect to inertial frames, in other words, you're forcing 
the motion of these bodies into non-inertial motion with respect to the inertial frames. The inertial frames, or Newton's absolute space, do not come under the senses. These are, these are concepts that we have in physics, but they're not concretized in physics. Have you ever bumped into an inertial frame? Now, Mach had this epistemological stance, which was that when you have an observable process like the centrifugal effect, it should be explained in terms of observable things, not unobservable things like inertial frames or absolute space. So Mach's point was, when a body has a natural tendency to move in a straight line at a uniform speed, but it's being forced away from that, and that gives rise to, let's say, something like the tension in the string or the different shape in the surface of the rotating water, it can't be because you're forcing um, the motion of the body away from its natural form, which is associated with these inertial frames. It must be because other bodies in the universe are acting on this body. If you were to take away, if God, as it were, were to remove all the rest of the bodies in the universe, you wouldn't get a centrifugal effect. You would not get tension between the globes when they rotate around each other. That was Mark's, that was Mark's idea. Now, exactly how you're supposed to formalize this theory, Mark left to others. Mark never had a formalization of this theory. But it's pretty clear when you think about it, that this is a theory that involves not just an action at a distance of the rest of the bodies in the universe, but a kind of super action at a distance. Why? If the bodies are too close, they will have a gravitational effect on the body that you're interested in. So it will not be a free body, and you won't be able to test Newton's first law of motion. So what we're really talking about are bodies that are so far away that there's no gravitational effect, so this body can be considered a, basically a free body, no forces, effectively no forces acting on it. And yet, nonetheless, its tendency to move in a straight line at uniform speeds with respect to the inertial frames is somehow being produced by the action of these super distant bodies. Maybe the, the, all the bodies in the whole of the rest of the universe. So this is like a super action at a distance. It's like a super action at a distance. But Mach had no, no equations for this, he had no formalization of this. To me, it's very strange that Einstein picked up this idea of a superaction at a distance and thought it would be consistent with special relativity. This I find very strange at first sight. Well, Mach's principle, as I say, was a, was a kind of an intuition. And it could be interpreted in many ways. And in fact, the history of Mach's principle in the history of, say, 20th century physics is a series of different interpretations of the principle according to different points of view. There are many, many versions of Mach's principle now in the literature. And indeed, Einstein himself produced various versions of the principle, as we will see. None of them worked. And in the end, he turned his back on Mach's principle. There was also the, the, the condition that the new theory of gravity would have to satisfy the conservation of energy momentum. Of course, this is a celebrated principle in the non-gravitational interactions and to a large extent, that didn't work either. And finally, there was the existence of the Newtonian limit. Well, here, if one's going to develop a new theory of gravity, because of the success of the Newtonian theory, you should be able to provide conditions, specify conditions, under which the new theory reduces to Newtonian predictions. Because they were hugely successful, for example, in, the, in planetary physics, predicting the, the, the trajectories of the planets. So there should be what's called the existence of a Newtonian limit, and there, that is a more straightforward feature of Einstein's um, theory of, of gravity. Notice that nowhere in this thinking does the action-reaction principle play a role. In other words, in 1905, until way beyond 1915, Einstein never remarked that his theory of special relativity, and indeed Newtonian gravity, which share the notion of inertia, the idea of inertia, were somehow violating the action-reaction principle. This is something that he, that he came to much later. His self-critique of his own theory of special relativity is nowhere to be found in 1905. So let's take a quick look at the weak equivalence principle. And here, you'll remember that Einstein 
in 1906, I think it was, referred to the happiest thought of his life. Imagine an unfortunate person who's working on the roof of their house and falls off the roof. Before that person hits the ground, the person is accelerating downwards, according to Newton's notion. But that person, in sort of in slow motion, realizes that his tools that are hanging, that have flown down with him, are all flying at exactly the same acceleration. And it looks as if gravity has disappeared. If you were, for example, in an elevator and the elevator had the misfortune of breaking and you were falling freely, everything in the elevator would start floating around. It would, you would feel as if there was no gravitational effect until, of course, you hit the ground. But in that meantime, it's as if gravity disappears. So a uniform acceleration has all the hallmarks of a gravitational free zone. There's all the feeling of a gravitational free zone. Putting it another way, if you were very, very, very far away from all the stars and the planets, for example, so the Newtonian notion of gravity would be very weak, if you were in a rocket and you accelerate the rocket uniformly, everything would, that was loose in the rocket would have a tendency to fall to the back of the rocket, and it would be exactly as if you created an artificial gravitational field. Okay? Just by accelerating the rocket, you would create an artificial gravitational field. And Einstein's insight was, that's not artificial. Maybe that's what gravity really is. Maybe that's what gravity really is. Well, we'll see how, how this played out. But the thing is that this connection between acceleration and a uniform gravitation, it was not you. This happiest idea of his life goes all the way back to Newton. Newton was fully aware of this. In fact, he used this principle in order to study, for example, the motions of the moons of Jupiter. What was new here? And indeed, there's a very nice paper by Simon Saunders, our colleague at Oxford, Rethinking Newton's Principia, where this connection between, and in particular corollary six, the connection between uniform accelerations and the gravitational field is very well spelt out in Newton's thinking. So what was new here? Well, the key here was Einstein's own interpretation of special relativity, and indeed its connection with electromagnetism. Now, in electromagnetism, as you know, you have electric fields and you have magnetic fields. And Maxwell discovered the equations that link them. And these equations are normally written down in inertial coordinate systems. Now, what happens if you change your inertial coordinate system to a, a moving inertial coordinate system? What happens to those equations? The equations take the same form because they satisfy the relativity principle. But the electromagnetic fields change their values. And in some cases, you can actually transform away the magnetic field, for example. It can disappear in the new coordinate system. You'll still maybe have you'll have an electric field, and it satisfies the same equations, but the electric and the magnetic fields are frame-dependent. Their values are frame-dependent. And Einstein thought of this as a kind of a unification of electric and mag magnetic phenomena. They're frame-dependent, but their combination is somehow frame-independent. Nowadays, we refer to this as the Einstein, sorry, the Faraday tensor. It's an object that you can write down in any coordinate system. And if you unpack that object, you get the electric fields coming out and you get the magnetic fields coming out. But the components of that tensor change from frame to frame. That's, so Einstein said, this is the first unified field theory. You have the electric fields, you have the magnetic fields. They each are frame dependent, but their combination somehow provides the unified theory. So that idea Einstein had in mind. He thought, wait a minute. If I can unify the electric field and magnetic field, each one of them being frame dependent, maybe it's the same with inertia and with gravity. Because I can, I, can, I can be in a gravitational field and I can accelerate in that gravitational field and I can do away with it. So there'll be some, some coordinate systems in which I'm looking at an inertial effect. I'll describe the physics in terms of inertia. And in some coordinate systems, I will describe the same effect as a gravitational effect, just like the electromagnetic fields, the electric and the magnetic fields. 
So to understand what Einstein was doing with the weak principle of inertia, you have to understand the way that he interpreted the electric and magnetic fields in special relativity. And this gave rise, this is, I'm now going to introduce, well, here's a quote from Einstein 1921. The same property, you're looking at a system, maybe you're looking at something like a centrifugal effect. The same property which is regarded as inertia from the point of view of an inertial coordinate system. So you're saying, well, I'm looking at the centrifugal effect, the body's rotating with respect to me, it's rotating with respect to my inertial frame, and I'm seeing an, uh, some kind of centrifugal effect, it could be the tension in, in a string between the globes or something. And I'm going to say that's just a consequence of the first law of motion, that a body has a tendency to move in a straight line at uniform speed. It has this inertial property. So I'm describing this property from the point of view of an inertial system not taking part in the rotation. But it can now be interpreted as a gravitational effect when regarded with, the, with respect to a system that shares the rotation. So I put a coordinate system on the rotating body. It's now starting to rotate. I'll still see the same effect. The effect doesn't depend on the existence of a coordinate system. But now I'm going to ascribe it to gravity. So this is, he's, he's highlighting here the connection, the analogy between the electric and magnetic fields in the case of inertia and gravity. And here, here comes, to me, one of those most surprising aspects of Einstein's understanding of his own theory. The inertia is supposed to be the, the centrifugal? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now this is work that was really clarified by Michelle Janssen and, and Dennis Lemko in recent years. This is the only equation in this talk, and this is the so-called geodesic equation, which tells you in general relativity, in the final theory, how a force-free body moves in space. So for example, you're going to use it to describe planets. Now, you might think that a planet is being affected by a Newtonian force with respect to the sun, but in general relativity, gravity is not a force. So the planets are freely falling, free test bodies. And this term here, the second derivative with respect to S, this X is just the spatial component of the body. The, this S is essentially related to time. So this is an accelerated term. This is the second derivative with respect to time. It's the rate of change or the rate of change of the position of the body. It's, a, it's the body's acceleration, okay? And this term here depends on the geometric structure of space-time. It doesn't matter for our purposes what that means. This is the, these are the, coefficients of the connection. So this term here depends on some geometrical property of space-time. And here's the point. You can choose a coordinate system. If you have a, a, test, a test body, no forces acting on it. No, no non-gravitational forces acting on it. You can choose a coordinate system in which this term vanishes. Because the, you can always make the, the coefficients of the connection vanish by choosing the correct coordinate system. Now, in that correct coordinate system, you've got the acceleration is equal to zero. Well, that's just another way of talking about inertia. Because if a body is moving in a straight line in a uniform speed, it is not accelerating. So with respect to that coordinate system, that is finite. I beg your pardon. This vanishes, and so this must vanish. That's an inertial coordinate system. OK, so you're saying, in that coordinate system, all the effects will be inertial effects. This is inertial motion. But you could choose another coordinate system in which these coefficients are not zero, and in which case, Einstein says, in that coordinate system, you've got an effect that depends on gravity. So gravity, the existence of a gravitational field depends on the choice of a coordinate system, again. And this is spelt out, in Einstein's view, in the so-called geodesic equation. Well, what this equation is telling you is that when you have the geometry of space-time, a force-free body will move along special lines that are defined as geodesics in the space-time. They are lines that are the straightest lines in a curved geometry. This is the so-called geodesic equation. How many people these days look at this equation and interpret it that way? That this term is inertia and that term is gravity. How many people think that gravity is, is, um, coordinate independent, is a coordinate-dependent effect? And in, in looking at it this way, for example, Remember, in the case of the electric fields and, and the magnetic fields and special relativity, we're not so much 
talking about their equivalents, we're talking about a unification. They're not really equivalents at all. Electric and magnetic fields are not equivalent. They have very different physics. So, in the case of the weak equivalence principle, we really shouldn't be talking about the equivalence of gravity and inertia. We should be talking about some kind of unification. This is a highly unorthodox way of understanding the geodesic equation in general relativity. So this was Einstein's. This was Einstein's point of view. I think until his death. I think until his death. But in the same breath that he talks about the unification of inertia and gravity, he makes another remark, which I think has been far too underplayed in the literature, which is the following. He says, look, the introduction of these labels, inertia, gravity, are in principle unnecessary. But for the time being, they do not seem worthless to me in order to ensure the continuity of thoughts. In other words, as you're developing general relativity, you're trying to teach it and promote it and so on, you're teaching people who've been brought up in the, in the language of Newton, where inertia and gravity are well-defined things. So he says, if you want to retain those notions, this is how you do it. But his real point is, well, this is only a crutch. General relativity is introducing a whole new way of thinking about physics, in which inertia and gravity are not fundamental terms. They're just not fundamental any more than inertial mass is fundamental in special relativity. Inertial mass is not a fundamental term in special relativity. And gravity and inertia should not be fundamental terms in general relativity. We're only using them because we can't quite rid ourselves of the, of the old Newtonian notions. Good. Now, coming back to the key principles, well, I've talked about the equivalence principle. Now I want to say just a few words about the relativity of, of motion. I said before that in special relativity you have this well-defined relativity principle that's related to experiments going on in laboratories that are inertial, that's to say they're at rest with respect to inertial frames, but they might be moving with respect to each other, each one defining an inertial frame. And Einstein's thought was this is too restricted, we want to have a relativity principle that generalizes to all possible coordinate systems. Is that true in general relativity? No. Of course, in general relativity, Einstein's field equations are generally covariant. They are generally covariant. And if you look, for example, at his 1916 review paper, the year after he developed his field equations, he gives you something like four arguments for general covariance. Why the equations, the fundamental equations, have to be generally covariant. That's to say they have to take the same form in all possible coordinate systems. I'm always reminded reading that stuff of, of the little story of the little boy who denied that he'd stolen the cookies. The first argument was, well, I couldn't reach them. The second argument was, well, I had trouble getting the, the top of the jar. <laughs> the third argument was, well, I don't like cookies anyway. And so on. And you sort of feel one is enough. <laughs> one is enough. At any rate, he will see in a moment that this led to catastrophe. And I said I had to change his views about the nature of general behavior. Mach's principle. Well, I've already given an introduction to that. Let's let's pick up Mach's struggle, Einstein's struggle with Mach's principle. First of all, from 1912 onwards, and this seemed to be more or less a recurring theme. I don't know when this stopped. Einstein introduced a complete misinterpretation of Mach. Mach said the inertial behavior of force-free bodies and the existence of the consequent existence of centrifugal effects and so on, is a result of in some kind of interaction with distant bodies in the universe. That's quite a different thing from saying that the inertial mass of that body is a result of the existence of different bodies in the universe. And Einstein read them both ways. What's the inertial mass? Well, if you have a force-free body, it wants to move in a straight line in the uniform speed. If you're going to apply a force to it, it's going to, it'll accelerate will no longer move inertia. If you have a given amount of force, how much, how big an acceleration will be the result depends on how lazy the body is to react to the force. And the degree of laziness is called the inertial mass. Okay, the greater the inertial mass, the less it accelerates when you give it a known quantity of force. So everybody, particularly in classical physics, has a well-defined inertial mass. 
Okay. All of you have well defined emotional masses. Now, Mach never said that the fact that you have inertial mass depends on the existence of all the other bodies in the universe, and that was an interpretation that Einstein used, thinking that it was Mach, for some years. Now, independently, so from 1912 to 1916, how is one supposed to develop Mach's principle? Now let's consider the, the correct version of Mach's principle, that the inertial motion of bodies depends on the existence of bodies in the rest of the universe. How is supposed, one supposed to give a formulation of this? Remember that Mach produced no equations. He had no real theory. It was just a kind of hunch. And Einstein introduced a kind of um, karate move. He, he managed to sort of skirt the issue in the following way. If you can somehow show that the inertial frames are not special, that no frames are special, that you don't have a problem anymore of explaining inertial properties. And that's what he thought the principle of general covariance would give you. Remember, general covariance is the idea that all the fundamental equations in physics would take the same form in arbitrary frames. So the inertial frames are no longer privileged. There is no more longer a problem with explaining inertial motion because they're defined with respect to inertial frames. Bingo. You didn't need a theory. You just have to get a, you have to somehow remove the special nature of inertial frames. And that's what he thought the principle of general covariance would do. And that's why there's a connection between the principle of general covariance in Einstein's mind and Mach's principle. Mach never thought this way, by the way. So here is Julian Barber writing in 1990. The drift of Einstein's thought is now clear, whereas the logic of Mach's comments call for an explicit derivation of the distinguished local frames of reference from a relational law of the cosmos as a whole, Einstein is working towards the elimination of the problem of the distinguished frames by asserting that they're not really distinguished at all. And similarly, Ren and Sauer in 2007, the generalized relativity principle, the principle of general covariance, so at least was Einstein's expectation. <clears throat> Sorry, that the, the generalized relativity principle would go a long way and might actually go all the way towards an implementation of Mach's critique of classical mechanics in the new theory of gravitation. So this is what the way that Einstein was, as it were, interpreting Mach and, and therefore skirting the necessity of providing some kind of equations for the superaction of the distance. It wasn't needed. Well, that's when disaster struck, because in 1918, Kretschmann published a famous paper showing that any theory under the sun could be given a generally covariant formulation, even Newton's theory of gravity. It was just a question of packaging. You could always make a theory generally covariant. You just write it in the appropriate tensor calculus. <clears throat> now, it might look a lot more complicated than when you started, but you're going to always do it. And Einstein thought, wait a minute. If this is just a question of packaging, if it's a question of formulation of a theory, and not the content of the theory, this can't be right. I mean, this idea that Mach's principle has to have some, some bite in physics. But general covariance, as a, as a demand, doesn't seem to have any physics. Something's gone badly wrong. Well, of course, <clears throat> and here he says, the fact this is 1924, some years later, the fact that the general theory of relativity has no preferred space-time coordinates which stand in a determinate relation to the metric, is more characteristic of the mathematical form of the theory than its physical content. So in a way, he's saying, yes, Kretschmann was right. But by the way, at the same time, he did have an answer to Kretschmann, which was a good answer in a way. And that was the following. <clears throat> if you take his equations for gravity, I'm sorry to use that word. I really shouldn't be. His equations for whatever it is we're discussing. Okay the fundamental field equations, Einstein field equations, that involve the so-called metric field, it turns out that they are written in general covariant form. In other words, they take the same form in any coordinate system you like, because they're written in the so-called tensor calculus. Now Einstein thought to himself, and he said, wait a minute, can I do the same with Maxwell's theory of the electromagnetic field? Yeah, Kretschmann said you can do it. 
You can always write it down a totalitarian form. But is that the natural form? It's not. Everything looks much more complicated. Much easier to look at Maxwell's equations when they're written in inertial coordinate systems. That's their natural format. You can see it. You can smell it. So Einstein said, okay, then there's something special about my equations for gravity. Despite Kretschmann, they're not simplified down by choosing some other privileged coordinate systems. That's not true for the other non-gravitational forces. So he's, he understands the force of Kretschmann's point, but he's saying still there's something special about my equations. It's just that it just, this doesn't hold across all physics. That's the point. I mean, really, it's a property of his equations. Now, I'm, I'm oversimplifying things a little bit, but I think this is essentially the way things work for Einstein. But at any rate, he no longer associates the principle of general covariance as being a solution to as being a, a solution to much problem. So where do we go from here? Well, now he had the idea, he provided a, in 1918 in particular, a precise formulation of Marx principle. Now remember, in, in, in general relativity, essentially what you've got is what are loosely called geometrical properties of space-time on one side of an equation, and these are properties of, essentially properties of the metric field, and on the right-hand side of the equation are the properties of matter. Things like us. So there's a connection between the metric field and its derivatives on one side and the properties of matter on the other, so-called stress energy tensor. So this is very loosely, this connection is somehow, sometimes referred to as matter makes space-time curve. I mean, this is a very loose talk. Matter makes space-time curve. But because test bodies move along geodesics defined by the geometry, um, we also say that space-time tells matter how to move. Matter makes space-time curve, but space-time tells matter how to move. And these are very loose terms, but they're essentially kind of very loose way of talking about Einstein's field equations. Now, if matter is somehow determining inertia, according to Mach, if distant matter is somehow determining inertia, and the geodesic motion is the way that you describe inertia in general relativity, then the properties of the metric which give rise to the geodesic, the geodesic equation should be determined by matter. That's the way his thinking went. The metric should be completely determined by matter. I myself am of the Amakian opinion, which in the language of relativity theory can be put in the following way. All masses of the world together determine the metric field, the so-called G mean U field. Inertia is, in my opinion, a mediated interaction between the masses of the world in the same sense as those effects in which Newtonian theory are considered as gravitational effects. So what he's really saying here is you can't have a metric field if you don't have matter hanging around it. Because without matter, you can't even define the metric. That's, that is his new formulation, given his equations, his new formulation of Mach's principle. Disaster. He himself realized that you can take his own equations, you can put all the stress energy tensor to zero that describe matter, and you still get non-trivial geometrical structure. In fact, you get the Minkowski space-time that's characteristic of special relativity. That's physics. Don't want that. So he started to meddle, he started to tweak his equation, and he put in the so-called cosmological constant. There are other reasons as well. But putting in the cosmological constant prevented the special relativity space-time emerging, which is, which is a physical thing, but it doesn't depend on the existence of matter. So that was, that was removed, and I thought, fine, now I'm still consistent with, with um, Max principles. But the great Dutch astronomer, Willem, Willem de Sitter, pointed out to him that even with the new equations, you could have vacuum solutions, non-trivial vacuum solutions, where there's no matter. And nowadays, we know that in general relativity, there's a component, as it were, of the metric field, so-called vial tensor, which doesn't depend on the existence of matter. So there's an aspect of the geometry of space-time that doesn't depend on the existence of matter. And eventually, through through interactions with the sitter, more and more, he, he, there were moments when he said, okay, well, maybe these, these vacuum solutions really do 
correspond to physics. And other times he would say, no, I don't like those solutions. I'm going to try to find a solution that has to have matter in it. He was, he was fluctuating in his, his views. But eventually, by 1921, he said, look, I give up, at least for the moment. And I say, the properties of the space-time continuum, which is really the metric, the so-called metric field, which determine inertia because they give rise to this geodesic motion of free bodies, the inertial motion, must be regarded as field properties of space analogous to the electromagnetic field. In other words, the metric field, this is completely, this goes against this, de this definition of Mach's principle. The metric field has a life of its own. In, the, in physics, we say it has autonomous degrees of freedom. It has a life of its own. And it lives independently of the existence of matter to some extent. Of course, if there's matter there, we'll affect it. But it has a life of its own, like the electromagnetic field. It has a life of its own. This is a big, big um, concession that Einstein makes. He really was reluctant to believe this for many years. But largely a result of his interactions with the sitter, he came to the conclusion that you have to treat the metric field as a physical field. Sometimes we, we talk about the curvature of space-time as, as being the fabric of space-time. Einstein didn't see the metric as being the fabric of space-time. He saw it as a physical field, right? rather like the electromagnetic field. Now, at this point, and now I'm coming towards the end of the talk, we see that the weak equivalence principle had a very idiosyncratic interpretation for Einstein. His understanding of the general of general covariance went through some radical changes, and in fact, its connection with Marx's principle seemed to, to be a, this supposed connection seemed to be a failure. And he could not find an interpretation of Marx's principle that eventually was consistent with his own, his own equations. He had to turn his back on Marx. And he did this very reluctantly. Much, much later, he, he said at one stage, but wait a minute, Marx's principle involves an action at a distance. How could I have thought this was true? And funnily enough, even when he says, for example, the general covariance is going to, so is going to, be, is going to solve this problem of Marx's principle, in the same breath, he says that inertial frames, inertial structure, depends on the existence of distant bodies. That I find very hard to understand as well. So Einstein's thinking was going all over the shop at this stage. Now, he realized then that Marx's principle couldn't be used in, in, as a kind of intuitive justification of his equations in general. He found these equations, despite all of the conceptual, this rocky road from his special relativity to general relativity, he found the equations. I like to say because his nose was more important than his, his brain. Well, of course, both were important. At any rate, he started to... Marsh Schlick was a philosopher who, who was trained in physics. He was a PhD student of, of Planck in optics. And after his PhD, he moved into philosophy of physics, philosophy generally. Of course, became one of the, the preeminent members of the Vienna Circle. Um, extremely important empiricist philosopher. But from 1915, the year that Einstein developed his field equations, up until the 19, early 1920s, he exchanged many letters with Einstein. And in fact, he wrote a long paper in 1915 that turned into a book on general, the philosophy of general relativity, and various new editions were coming out year after year. And Einstein liked this book. Einstein admired Schlick. Einstein saw Schlick as a philosopher who understood physics, understood what he was trying to do in general relativity. So they had this long correspondence, and in fact, 26 letters were exchanged in this period of 1915 to 1920. And I just want to refer very quickly to a key thing that occurred in, the, in this exchange of letters. Here is Einstein saying in 1920, I think it would be correct to say that Newtonian physics has to attribute objective reality to acceleration. So this is the motion that's not inertial motion independent of the coordinate system, because it gives rise to things like centrifugal effects. This is only possible if one regards absolute space as something real. This is exactly Mach's point. What is this thing accelerating with respect to? Well, some kind of notion of an absolute something. We would say nowadays the absolute inertial frames. Newton does this in a coherent way. What remains unsatisfactory is the circumstance 
that this something only enters one way into the causal chain. The absolute space of Newton is independent, cannot be influenced, whereas the G field in my theory of general relativity is subject to laws of nature determined by matter, and not only determining how matter moves. Action reaction principle. It's good in my theory, because my equation tells you that my G field is being influenced by matter and influences matter in, in return. But Carl Newton, although he had a, a very successful theory, his idea of inertia depended on you know, these inertial effects, like the centrifugal effect, depended on saying that somehow absolute space was playing a causal role. Well, was it? Not for Newton. We've already seen that for Newton, space, absolute space for Newton, played absolutely no causal role in understanding inertia. So much so that it failed to impede inertial motions. So this is not historically correct, but nonetheless, maybe there's a good intuition here. But Schlick wrote to him and said, look, absolute space does not have to be considered in Newtonian mechanics, and by the way, the same thing in special relativity, as a cause in the sense of the principle of causality. In other words, Newtonian mechanics does not have to consider inertial resistance in the context of certain kinds of motion as an effect of absolute acceleration. It can instead take the former as the defining criterion of the latter. Now what Schlick is essentially saying here is the following. The inertial motion of force-free bodies is not being caused by anything. In fact, what we mean by inertial frames are precisely those coordinate systems relative to which force-free bodies in the universe do what they do. There's no causal notion here. In fact, we're defining the inertial frames in terms of the behavior of these inertial bodies. And that's just a brute fact of nature. So there's no violation of the action-reaction principle because the inertial frames aren't doing anything. They're defined in terms of the motion of these force-free bodies. And I think that's got to be right. And I think people after, after Mach understood this. And, but Einstein himself never picks up this point, and he says, physical space possesses reality, according to the general theory of relativity too. Here he means the metric field, but not an independent one, where its properties are completely determined by matter. Space is incorporated into the causal nexus without playing a one-sided role in the causal chain. He thinks this one-sided role is in Newton and special relativity. Well, it is contrary, Einstein says, to the mode of scientific thinking to think of a thing which acts itself but which cannot be acted upon. So this is a clear statement, the action-reaction principle. Every physical object influences and in general is influenced by in turn by others. The latter is not true of the ether, absolute space, of Newtonian dynamics. But in the special theory of relativity, in the special theory of relativity, the, the ether was also absolute, incidentally, simply because in the special theory of relativity, all the notions of inertia are exactly the same as in Newton's theory. The ether of the general theory of relativity differs from that of classical mechanics or the special theory of relativity, respectively, insofar it is not absolute, but is determined in its local variable properties by ponderable matter. It's affected by matter. So he is now the new form of promoting his theory. It's not Marx's principle. It's not general covariance. It's the action-reaction principle. Now the question really arises, was he right to make this distinction between his theory and the previous theory? And this, I think, is very, very controversial. And in my view, he was wrong. But just a final remark. Here's the last slide. So again, in 1921, he wrote, a, he wrote the following, it is contrary to the mode of thinking in science to conceive of a thing which acts itself but which cannot be acted upon. We've seen that phrase. This is the reason why Ernst Mach was led to make the attempt to eliminate space as an active cause in the system of mechanics. Now, I've read a fair amount of Mach in, your, in, in his, his, his early a little translations of Mach, and I cannot find anywhere a justification of Mach's principle based on the action reaction. So this is a case of Einstein being his opportunistic worst. <laughs> in 1954, the year before his death, Einstein admitted that Mach's principle was hopeless, and he recognized 
And in fact, you can see this particularly in the Lagrangian approach to general relativity, but you can't even define the stress energy tensor for matter without independently get, uh, specifying a, uh, a metric field. So, Max principle played a very important role originally in Einstein's search for the new theory of gravity. He had to give it up, and there are a number of reasons why it was doomed. But this, as a pr sort of promotional aid, was replaced by the action-reaction principle. And so I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, so the usual practice is to let the people from Geneva ask some questions. The sound wasn't working out too well before, so that's... Yeah. Can you guys hear me? People have questions here? Can you cut your speaker out? I don't have my hand on the microphone. I can turn it down a little. It's okay right now. Go ahead. Oh yeah, you can as good. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot for the talk. So, um, you mentioned Harvey that the uh, um, anti-magnetic being the first one to actually realize the laser theory with the action reaction principle. Did I get this correctly? Say that again, Neil. Sorry, say that again. You, you mentioned that Einstein wasn't the first to actually realize the action reaction principle in the space time theory. Or you didn't say that. No. I think he was. Say the I think it was the first to stress its importance in the case of in the case of space-time theories. Ah, okay, good. Yeah. And that uh, it's up to okay. I can always give myself a few. Yes. Where is that again? So. Um, you, you said we had a special fitness. Oh, sorry, Jasmine, I'll take a No, we, we, I, we can hear you. We can hear you, Nils. Okay, I just have to close my ears. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, sorry, one more time. Uh, you mentioned that you have a special opinion um, on the related to one else as well, um, about whether Einstein was right to stress that the action reaction principle was first realized in GR. Did I get this? Yes, I mean, he claimed that the action reaction principle is fails in Newtonian mechanics and in special relativity. Hey, Harvey. Harvey, if you look at him here, then he'll, he'll be looking at, oh, he'll right. see your face. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you can opinion that this wouldn't be absolute here, so could you kind of give it a fun bit? Yes, yes. Let's, let's consider the first law of motion, which is, which is, um, is common to both Newtonian mechanics and special relativity. Force-free bodies move in straight lines in uniform speeds. With respect to what? Motion is relative. So we have to ask ourselves, what is, what are we defining this motion with respect to? And then, of course, the answer in physics is inertial frames. And then the question is, how do you define an inertial frame? It's a frame relative to which force-free bodies move in straight lines at uniform speeds, and we seem to be caught in a circle. We seem to be caught in a circle. Now the question is, what is the content of the first law of motion? Now, of course, there are bodies in the world which, to, to, a, to a certain degree of approximation, um, can be regarded as force-free. I mean, bodies that are very far away from other bodies, or, for example, bodies on a frictionless surface where the force, let's say the force of gravity, is, is perpendicular to the surface. So these are examples of potentially force-free bodies. Now, to say that this content in the first law is to say that there exists a coordinate system, at least one, relative to which the force-free bodies do their thing. They have this very simplified description. Their motion is, has a very simplified description. The existence of such a coordinate system is highly non-trivial. Okay, 
But if it exists, it's only because the force-free bodies have this kind of orchestrated motion. Okay. In other words, it's a way, it's a mathematical way of describing the, 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 the orchestrated motion of force-free bodies. It doesn't explain anything. The first law of motion is a brute fact that there exists such an inertial frame that simplifies the description of the force-free bodies. There's no, there's no issue here of a causal connection between space and the, and the inertial motion of bodies. Where is the violation of the, of the action-reaction principle? And remember, as I said before, when Einstein is developing special relativity, he's aware of its limitations. Its, its fundamental limitation was it wasn't able to provide, you couldn't provide at the same time a theory, a relativistic theory of gravity. But in 1905, he never even hinted that another problem might be that it violates the action-reaction principle. I think this is um, very much an afterthought. Does that answer your question, Nils? So, so I, have a, <clears throat> I have a question as well. Uh, now, it may well be the case that the action reaction principle is sort of rhetoric or interpretive um, additions that come uh, very much as an afterthought of the development of relativity, and that therefore it's completely absent in the context of the discovery of GR. It may still, of course, play an important role in the next of justification. Maybe that were considered interpretation to that longer, so that this is the way to think about it. So it's sort of, well, it's not just that, it's the right way to, to, to interpret what's going on. And, you know, you, you maybe recognizing that it was misled sort of down the garden path for the Marx principle of other ideas like that. And that's the final consideration. So what do you think about that? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Chris. Well, here's the way I, I would put it. If you look at Einstein's field equations, it's a, it's, it's a sort of trivial remark that the G field and the matter fields are interacting. Okay, so it's hardly a profound insight that they satisfy the action-reaction principle, at least in, in, the, in the sense that Einstein is thinking. It's patent. I mean, anyone looking at the field equations will realize that the action-reaction principle, in this sense, is not being violated. The question is, is it any more interesting than in previous theories of space-time? In other words, is this a defining or a characteristic feature of general relativity? That was Einstein's claim, and I think it's highly controversial. Uh, I mean, one way to read this is that uh, the G field now does uh, interact, and you know, it, it has product geometric significance, and it interacts with other different fields in ways in which product geometry has not in any prior space that field. Yes, but the question is, there's no doubt that, for example, the Minkowski metric is absolute. There's no doubt about that. In a, in, and the, the, the metric in general relativity is not absolute, it's dynamical. No one denies that. The, the only question is, does the Minkowski metric play a causal role in special relativity? Does Galilean space-time structure play a causal role in Newtonian physics? What's your view on that? So, so the question is not. So, so, so you recognize that GR is an innovation uh, with respect to earlier space-time theories in that it lets space-time, uh, in some sense of the word, be active upon, whereas the others didn't. But you're interested in the other direction, whether space-time really acts upon matter in any Calls the relevant place a causally efficacious agent or something. That's the direction we're interested in. Yeah, I, and I mean, you 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 may you may be aware of the fact that in in my own work I'm trying to argue that that Minkowski space time in particular is not really space time per se, but it's 
it's merely a codification of the symmetries and the non-gravitational interactions. And it couldn't, in principle, play a causal role. So to compare Minkowski space-time with, with the metric field in general relativity is like comparing apples and, and pears. Do we have other questions from Geneva? We can come back to you. Okay. So, questions from the audience here. I thought I saw a hand coming up during the talk. I forgot what I was going to say. Yes. Uh, like, uh, I have a like, naive question. Uh, so, like, uh, the way you compare electric fields and magnetic fields uh, being a kind of pair that is independent of coordinate systems, and then you compare the same with inertia and gravity. Uh, do we have any other two physical quantities that act as the same kind of pair in physics? That's a very good question. Nothing comes to mind, but that, um, that certainly doesn't mean that there aren't other examples. But as I say, nothing comes to mind at the moment. Um, Tushar, could you think of anything that uh, might play that role? If you give me extra dimensions, I can give you uh, all those gauge the, fields you, where it's right. electric and magnetic. Yes. But it's sort of the same thing, just yeah. in different dimensions. Yeah. Um, I mean, the closest I can think of is, is something like an internal symmetry, but that's, you know, where again, you've got sort of different descriptions and, uh, of this, well, different components and different coordinate systems in the internal space. So, you know, isospin or like any, any kind of, um, um, you know, anything from the standard model or whatever, but that's, that's a, that's of a completely, that's of a quite different kind. Um. Yeah, that's all I can think of off the top of my head. Because the other, I mean, like electroweak unification is not as done in the same way as like a space-time unification. I mean, what about this? So, I mean, thinking about the Bogliabov, I mean, transformations, it's not between inertial frames, but from inertial to non-inertial right. frames in GR right. changes right. the particle content. Right. right. I don't know, but that's not ex exactly unifying things. Yeah, that's a great question. There's something kind of special about the geometry that you're using in electromagnetism. Yeah. Because like uh, when we were reading about special relativity, right. like uh, we understood that actually electric, electric fields and magnetic fields are the same thing. That depends basically on which frame of reference you're looking for. But are they the same thing? Like, um, like it depends on the reference frame you're looking for. That's right. That's right. But in each reference frame, you can distinguish the electric and the magnetic fields. Now, as I mentioned before, you can look at this from a four-dimensional point of view where you introduce this Faraday tensor. Yeah. And you could say that that's the fundamental thing. But every time you write down the physics in an inertial frame, that tensor can be divided into electric effects and magnetic effects. So it's, it's sort of unclear to me whether it's right to say that they're the same thing. They're dis different aspects of the same thing, perhaps, but they are distinct, um, and they have distinct properties. Um, it's just that they have this funny role, as you say, that how their 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 quant the, the value of the quantity of electric effects and the quantity of magnetic effects depends on the choice of reference frame. I was I was going to say something, but then I decided not to because I thought it would make me a parody of myself, and then Nick. Just whispered to me, um, bosons and fermions and supersymmetric <laughs> theories might be, uh, you know, because obviously supersymmetry exists. We just haven't found it yet. Obviously. Um, so, <laughs> but so so spell that out a bit. Just in the sense that um, you know, I mean, it it seemed like what 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 was working against the sort of the internal um, space, the the internal degrees of freedom argument that I, examples that I had earlier was exactly that that they were internal and not spatiotemporal, um, but in supersymmetric field theories, you can you can go into a into a superspace description, which is which in a lot of ways ha has um, sort of quite spacey temporal properties, and in that sense, the uh, the larger multiplet that consists of both the bo bosons and the fermions together um, 
might count might counter something similar to this in the sense that the the it's not that they're equi- it's not that they're uh, equivalent to each other. It's that they're unified in a larger object, and then each of the former categories that you each of the ca- categories that you had formerly uh, just reflects one aspect of the uh, of the larger uh, of the more fundamental object. And then, depending on the frame that you're interested in, you uh, depending on your frame of reference, you you have sort of one description rather than another. Well, that was a that was a good question. Did you say you remembered? Um, I have like a lot of questions that were in my head, but I'm <laughs> very new to this field, and so whatever I say is probably not doesn't We're all friends I, here. I don't know <laughs> when I give it's lectures. only going on video on YouTube. <laughs> don't worry, there are only three people watching. Oh well, now two, so uh, okay. the recording will then. <laughs> um, I was just wondering about what bodies at a great distance had to do with, like, understanding what inertia was. Say that again, please. Like, what, what, what? bodies at a distance have to do with inertia? Well, I mean, you're putting your finger on the difficulty in Mark's idea. Mark's, Mark is saying, look, we see these inertial effects like the centrifugal effect. Okay? Something happens when you try to force a body away from its natural motion, you're going to create some kind of tension. So for example, in a string, if you're, you, know, you put a rock in the end of a string and you're wearing it around, you're going to build up tension in that string. Because the body wants to move away tangentially. That's its natural motion. And you're forcing it against its natural motion. So you're going to create a tension in the screen. That's a physical effect. Now what is it due to? Well, it's due to the first law of motion. It's due to the fact that force-free bodies will move in straight lines at uniform speeds. This is a brute fact of nature. Is there a causal component to this? Is there some way we can understand the cause of this inertial motion? Now, Mark, I think, mistakenly thought that, that the, it is, there is a causal explanation, and it has to do with the fact that these bodies, um, their, their natural inertial motions, are being somehow determined by the nature of absolute space. And he thought that can't be a good explanation because you're referring to an observable effect, and you're trying to explain it in, th- in terms of something unobservable. That went against his philosophy of science. That went against his notion of explanation. Nowadays, we don't think like that so much. Okay. So if it's not space that's supposed to be acting on the body to tell it how to move, what could it be? It has to be other bodies. Where are these other bodies? Very, very distant. It's just a hunch that he had. It's a sort of a hunch that he had, but he didn't provide a real theory for it. But if they're very, very distant, how is he expecting them to still have enough back? Well, here's the way I, I read Mark. And I'm not an expert on Mark, but I think, I, think that, I think it has to be something along the following lines. Think of Newtonian gravity. Okay? Two, two massive objects are affecting each other instantaneously at a distance. That's very hard to get your head around. In fact, outside of Britain, when Newton first proposed this mechanism, action the instantaneous action of the distance, it was widely repudiated, particularly by the continental physicists, for good reason. It's very hard to understand how this could be the case. Newton simply said, well, look, I've tried to find theories about an intermediary in space that somehow this effect here is propagated through space and it affects the system over here and vice versa. I couldn't find a mechanism. So we're just going to have to go with this. We're just going to have to play this. It's going to be useful, and we're going to make all kinds of interesting predictions. And they all were born out. Almost all of them were born out. But it's very hard to get your head around this idea of action at a distance. For Mach, that was no problem. Because for Mach, all that physics is, is a way of making economical accounts of what we see, of our observable, the observable things in nature. Now, whether it introduces things like instantaneous action at a distance, Mach didn't really care too much. He just thought, all I want are regularities, economic regularities describing physical phenomena. So if I have to introduce yet another one involving even further bodies to explain inertia, so be it. 
did any of these thinkers ever try to trace everything that we can observe now back to like the origins of the universe and like to define like the nature of space at a distance compared to now and related to the big bang of, to say anything about like the nature of space at a distance so the nature of well don't forget that at this stage we're talking about essentially we're talking about developments that occurred between 1905 and 1915 and this was years and years before the development of the Big Bang Theory. In fact, it was years before Einstein himself realized that his equations described, in general, a non-static universe. And he was very reluctant to accept this idea for a long time because he didn't see any evidence for it. But people were pointing out to him that there were solutions of his own equations that described, for example, an expanding universe. This, this took place years later. This took like years later. Can I have a question from Geneva, please? Sure. Ooh, okay. <laughs> and, uh, I was wondering what, how do you analyze or what, what's your tools of the tools of experiments that you mentioned from Newton Bucket and this uh, rotating disk? How do I analyze them? Yeah, I mean. Who, who, who's right, I think, I'm trying to have or or that I'm not a Well, <clears throat> it all comes back to how you understand the first law of motion. Because these effects depend on the, the validity of the first law of motion. The centrifugal effect, the Coriolis effect, all of these things are, go back to the first law of motion. So is, is the question that you're asking me how to understand the first law of motion? Uh, no, no. The question is, uh, there's this uh, analysis about these two experiments that you just think about, clarifying my question. But if, if you ask me how to analyze, for example, the rotating bucket, then the, then the analysis must involve the first law of motion. How, how else does one explain centrifugal effects? And Newton was well aware of this. So there is nothing about absolute space, even in analysis of the experiment. There was for, for Mach, but uh, I mean, New, well, Newton believed in absolute space for other reasons. In other words, right. if you look, for example, at the bucket experiment, a lot of people regard this as an argument for the existence of absolute space. For Newton, it had nothing to do with the existence of absolute space. The bucket argument was designed to kill, as it were, to critique Descartes' theory of relative motion. It was a perfect example of a of a thought experiment, as it were, that would that would destroy Descartes' theory of relative motion. Newton's argument for absolute space were of a completely different nature, and they had very little to do with the first law of motion. And this here you'll you'll find, for example, the argument for absolute space very well described in the De Gravitazione. And the argument goes something like the following. Suppose we're looking at the stars in, in the heavens, and we want to develop a theory that tells us how they move. First of all, you have to have a theory of motion. What are they moving? I mean, what are the properties of their motion? Well, you say, OK, I see a planet moving with respect to the, to the fixed stars. And I can plot that trajectory with, effect, with, effect, with, re, with reference to the fixed stars. Now, ever since Descartes, we realize that the stars are not fixed. I mean, they're fixed to a really reasonably good approximation. But we're doing fundamental physics here. We're not doing approximate physics. How do you define the motion of a body when all the other bodies in its vicinity are moving? You're looking over time and you're saying, OK, I can see this body has moved with respect to the other bodies, but they've moved amongst themselves. I've lost now 
a quantitative understanding of the motion of the, of the planet. So Newton said, if you're going to define real motion, you've got to do it in a way that doesn't refer to the relative motion with respect to other bodies. And that means you've got to introduce the idea of absolute space. Real motion is motion with respect to absolute space. This is nothing that this is completely prior to the first law of motion. Okay? This raises a problem. And in a sense, Mark was right. Absolute space does not fall under the senses. How do you know you're moving with respect to absolute space? Absolute space does not come equipped with signposts. This is, a, this is a point that Aristotle made against the atomists, the original Greek atomists, who claimed that the atoms were falling in space. And Aristotle said, what do you mean by falling? You don't have signposts in space, empty space. So Newton, in the Principia, in his, in his famous scolium, says at one stage, the problem with my theory of motion that that appeals to absolute space is that absolute space does not fall under the senses. Good. But the situation is not altogether desperate. <laughs> I'm, I'm quoting him literally. The situation is not altogether desperate. Because we have things like rotating buckets, and in particular, the rotating globes. Now, I don't know what absolute space is, but if I have two globes that are circling each other and there's a tension in the, spur in, the, in the string, they must be rotating with respect to absolute space. That's what my theory tells me. So suddenly, you've gone from something that looks entirely metaphysical to something that looks operational. And that was the, that was the point of the rotating globes, in the thought experiment of the rotating globes. The bucket experiment was designed to, to, to perform a critique of Descartes' motion, the notion of relative motion. Does that help to answer the question? Uh, because uh, I have this in, uh, in the literature on both experiments that everyone analyzes the concept of the question, the establishing absolute space, so it would take the very to have a sense of the relation between the experiments. Nick, do you want to say something about this? You're being an, an expert on this sort of stuff? Um, many, many things, I guess. I would say that, I mean, since just on that very last point about whether it's an argument for absolute space, I mean, I tend to take it as there being a sort of implicit disjunctive syllogism, like the relational and absolute accounts are sort of all that's on the table at that point of the scolium. So to the extent that yeah, there's nothing else that's absolute, you know, that might be on the table that is ruled out the Cartesian count. There is sort of an argument for his account. But otherwise, I do very much agree about the way you set up the bucket versus versus the globes. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to ask my question now, if I may, Please. since you get to have lunch. Um, and it was a, so this is actually pretty interesting because it's something we've been talking about in a metaphysics class. Um, uh, you mentioned, um, right, so Einstein's response to Kretschmann, and so, well, you know, what's going on in, what's the physical content of GR, or what's the physical point of general, of general covariance in, that we have in GR that we don't have in electromagnetism in, in special relativity, and, well, you, there's a nice set of simple frames that you can write electromagnetism in, in special relativity, and there's nothing like that in GR. Okay? It's an oversimplification, but you're essentially correct. So my question, so the question actually then just comes down to, is that the whole point, that they're simpler? Or does the simplicity sort of show something else somehow? You might have used the word natural as well. I mean, they're yeah. simpler. Okay, we all agree yeah, yeah. they're simpler. Yeah. Is that the whole point, or is this indicative well, of something more, well, of more nature, substance in than In nature, that? when we find that the particular expression of something is simple, it's because nature has a certain form. This is not arbitrary. Nature must be such that electromagnetic effects have their natural or simplest formulation in inertial frames. That's the way I would put it. But gravity doesn't have that kind of property. So I guess I'm, was it Jonathan Schaeffer that was? So the next question is, would it be a mistake 
a more than pragmatic mistake not to write it in the simpler forms? No. That's a societal thing, isn't it? You're not going to go to jail. I mean, yeah. it's a bit like, take a hydrogen atom, which has spherical symmetry. When you're taught the hydrogen atom in quantum mechanics, you use spherical polar coordinates because everything looks simpler. If you went back to Cartesian coordinates and you wrote everything out in Cartesian coordinates, would you actually make any fundamental predictive errors? Oh, you just put the word predictive in there. Well, <laughs> will you make any, I mean, Descriptive when, errors. Descriptive errors. Would there well, be any descriptive errors? No. Yeah. And certainly you're not going to go to jail. But you'd be silly to do that. In the same way, for example, is in the case of in the case of, I don't know, electromagnetism, we use the Einstein Planckberg convention for synchronizing distant clocks. You don't have to. You could choose a convention that makes the one-way speed of light anisotropic. Yeah. And people have actually written down Maxwell's equations in those coordinate systems. And they're horrible. You can do it, but nobody does it because you're just making life difficult for yourself. But you're not making any factual mistakes in that sense, any predictive mistakes. But you're ignoring a feature of nature that makes certain coordinate systems more natural with respect to those phenomena. And I think that is a feature of nature. Look, can I just? But make is, an... is that? I guess that's the. Is that ignoring yeah. that that feature of nature? some kind of mistake it's a mistake in the sense that you are making life difficult for yourself when you needn't the ex you know they're not thinking in the metaphysical literature they're thinking about well let's just talk about things in terms of grew and blean ah right yeah Did yeah because it's the same point yeah, it is the same point yeah. and that's it just is the, it is the same point you'd be silly to do it yeah but you can do it it just means that you have to introduce an arbitrary discontinuity in your, in your thinking. I think, by the way, it, the same thing applies, I, I forget who I was mentioning this to the other day. Take the, something like the metric of time in special relativity, take the metric of time. Clocks now are the most accurate devices. The latest atomic clocks lose one second in the age of the universe. It sounds like 14 billion.